All right, Darwinian theory has already been debunked by the biologists. Many biologists suggest that, and I'm quoting them, random mutation and natural selection have long been recognized by many evolutionaries themselves to be insufficient to account for the complexity of life. They say that neutral drift is quantitatively more important than natural selection in understanding genetic differences between organisms. Further, the mechanisms of evolution and the relative importance are continuously subject to careful examination and revision. So careful examination of the evidence has not been avoided. So I'm saying if, 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 it's, if it's not, remember what it said here, if it's, not, if, if it's not random mutation and natural selection, and you say that's already been debunked, why don't you sign the statement with me? And so, so they say neutral drift. What's neutral drift? That's the small ch genetic changes that occur between me and my children, and then between them and their children. These small, that's more important than this natural selection process and, and this random mutation. And the other thing is the mechanisms involved. So evolution, this is quoting them, is both about the mechanism by which change occurs over time and the theory of universal common descent. This is what biologists tell me. Evolutionary biology. Evolution is about the mechanisms by which change occurs over time. Okay, so we want to see mechanisms. And the theory of universal common descent. First of all, the universal common descent theory is a very advanced theory, and it has a lot going for it. I concede it has a lot going for it. It is an amazing theory. Let's look at this, though. Common descent versus uncommonness. Humans have about 20,000 protein-coding genes. That means that within the DNA, there's about 20,000 segments that, that make these proteins that then are the little nanomachines that build us. That's why, you, you know, you can, you, you can eat a kolache today and tomorrow, you know, it's, it's a part of the skin on your hand. How does that happen? Well, because we have these little nano, nanomachines that do this and these proteins are these nanomachines. So this is coded by the DNA. The DNA has the code for this. But that is only 1.5% of the entire DNA in the human genome. It's within the 1.5% that common descent studies are primarily focused, in that 1.5%. So a large-scale project was instituted in 2003 by the U.S. National Genome Research Institute. That's not a Christian organization, it's a federal organization, called the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE. And it seeks to determine the role of the remaining 98.5% of the genome that was formerly poorly called junk DNA. They no longer call it junk, they call it, in, they call it the intergenic regions or intergenic DNA. There's ENCODE evidence that part or even much of the intergenic regions have regulatory elements that can affect gene transcription. So in other words, they're not junk. We're, they're, they were finding it. So what happened was that that when this started coming out, they would say, oh yeah, there's not that many, there's only about a hundred or so of those segments that are relevant. And then the next year there were thousands. And the next, and the next year there were tens of thousands. Finding that within that 98.5%, there's huge amounts. Remember, all of universal common descent, the vast majority of universal common descent is based on 1.5% of the DNA. So if you look at that 1.5% of the DNA, we are 99.99% the same as a chimpanzee. But if you look at another 98.5%, that's where the differences occur. If you look at just that 1.5%, we're 70% the same as a dandelion. <laughs> it's true. There's work on orphan genes called orphans, which cast new light on the uniqueness of some genetic information. Orphan genes are considered unique to a narrow taxon, generally a species. Therefore, orphan genes are markers for uncommonness. Okay, so the uncommon human being. Humans alone have the capacity for art, music, advanced communication, advanced mathematics, and religious practice, which constitute the broader organization of symbolism. Therefore, if one is intent upon a common descent model, there was a massive and presently unexplainable infusion, intrinsic or extrinsic, along the proposed very short descent pathway between Australopithecines and the modern humans. That's in universal common descent. We're right below Neanderthal or Australopithecines. If it were an intrinsic infusion, then the requisite anatomical and chemical differences between the modern human brain and other hominid brains are presently indiscernible and unfathomable. And the chemical basis for the evolutionary mechanisms for such changes are both unknown and presently immeasurable. If the infusion were extrinsic, meaning some outside influence did it, then the materialist evolutionist and the supernaturalist share some common ground. 
The mechanisms are unknown for that. Here's the mechanism problem. This is right off of Wikipedia. What is a body plan? A body plan is the ground plan, is an assemblage of morphological features shared among common members of a phylum level group. The term is usually applied to animals and envisages the blueprint encompassing aspects such as symmetry, segmentation, limb deposition. You know, our limbs are, are deposited differently than, say, in a tiger. That's body plan organization. And it is, it is thought that this evolved very, very gra evolved gradually through this Paleozoic period. Nobody understands the mechanism. Remember what biology is about, evolutionary biology, from their own words. It's that evolutionary biology is about universal common descent, of which we're finding there's a lot of uncommonness in the other 98.5% of the DNA. And the other thing is about mechanisms. We have no mechanisms. We have no mechanisms for brain. Why, why our brains are working so much differently than other hominids, meaning, meaning than, than, than chimpanzees and apes. What, why is it? What is it about our brain that is so different? We don't know. It's obviously different. We, we can't even tell. So where's the mechanism? The mechanism isn't there. We can't fathom the mechanism for body plan changes. So the mechanism problem, any massive functional change of a body part would require multiple concerted lines of variations. Sure, one can ex suggest small changes ad infinitum, but a concerted requirement of multiple changes all in the same place at the same time is impossible to chemically fathom. One day we might know. As of today, we don't know. That doesn't mean we'll never know. We may know someday. As of right now, we don't know. <clears throat> but evolutionary biology has been reduced to storytelling with little chemical mechanistic data to support its claims. You ask an evolutionary, how does that happen? And they'll go through and they'll tell you a story. G give me the mechanism for that. How do the chemicals do this sort of thing? Look, I just told you the mechanism. No, you didn't. You told me a story. There's no chemistry in that. There's no molecules. Show me the paper that show me molecular structure. Nothing, nothing. It's storytelling. And then you present to them the totally opposite argument. They'll tell you another story for that. Great storytellers. It's been reduced to storytelling. This is true. So there's collective cluelessness. <laughs> Therefore, I don't understand the mechanisms needed to change body plans or the mechanisms along the descent pathway between Australopithecines brain and modern human brains if we are indeed commonly descended as predicted by the universal common descent theory. And nobody else understands the mechanisms either. Nobody. Nobody. They can say what they will, but nobody understands it. This is why they avoid me. If they had the answers, they wouldn't avoid me. But unlike most, I'm saying it publicly. And many people don't want to say it publicly because it has ramifications in their careers. Collective cluelessness. Recall quoting the biologist, evolution is both about the mechanism by which change occurs over time and the theory of universal common descent. The mechanisms are unknown, and the theory of universal common descent, though robust, is being confronted by evidence that can be interpreted as uncommonness. So further studies warranted. I would never say we shouldn't work on this. We should work on this. But it's going to need a lot more study to be convincing. Here's some vacillating so-called scientific facts that are really theories. We already considered two. Junk DNA versus intergenic DNA and its regulatory function. So it... You, 20 years ago, it was said that 98.5% that of the DNA is junk. You know, it's from things in the past that has no regulatory function, doesn't do anything. Well, now that's changed. So that was what was called a scientific fact, that 98.5% is junk. That's a fact. Believe it. That's a fact. Uh, no, it's not a fact. Remember, facts don't change, but theories change. So what was touted as being a fact was really a theory. We looked at another one, evolutionary theory formerly dominated by random mutation and natural selection is now replaced by neutral drift and universal common descent as the dominate, dominant fe features. So this thing that was drilled into middle-aged people here, that random mutation and natural selection was what, what evolution is all about? Oh, uh, sorry, that's wrong. We got a new, new one here. So it, it's not fact at all. How about the genetic diversity in humans cannot have resulted from a single breeding pair. We cannot have, and I'm talking about the biological Adam and Eve, who were the, 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 the first progenitors of the human race. It is, it is believed that, that it could not have been just two people. It had to be far more diverse than that. Well, that scientific fact is being questioned as, as of this year. 
As of 2018, genetic experiments are showing that a single breeding pair in the last 10,000 years, or even 6,000 years, can account for the genetic diversity in humans, provided that interbreeding with human-like creatures, like Neanderthals, was occasionally occurring. You say, well, humans wouldn't breed with ne Neanderthals. Human sexual behavior never surprises me. <laughs> never does. And, and uh, uh, that there was intermingling with things that were humanoid, it, it happens, it, it, you know, these, these things happen. I mean, and uh, uh, things that aren't even humanoid happens today. And so once you provide for that, then it could have come from a single breeding pair. Do not let scientists with the bold claim of quote-unquote facts upset you. Theories or conjectures are not facts. But unfortunately and shamefully, many scientists themselves do not make the necessary distinction. This leads to confusion of generations of students and even professors themselves. Professors have told me, look, evolution is a fact. Well, it depends on how you define evolution. You want to have small changes? Yeah, you can see that all the time in the lab. Have you ever seen evolution of a complex system? And what they'll do is they'll, they'll give you lots of references on the immune system. The immune system morphs based on what's presented to it. And my argument to them, yeah, and it, it remained an immune system. It never became a digestive system. <laughs> it remained what it was. Show me evolution of a complex system. Even propose to me how that would happen. You don't even have to have done it. Just show me how that immune system would morph into a different system. And they get extremely frustrated with me. And why is that? Why would they get frustrated? Well, maybe because it's more like a religion. Maybe so. 